guitar players are just conservative by nature. They want to play the guitars that their heroes play, right? For the most part. There are some players who are more adventurous and want to try something new, and I think those are our main customers. But, you know, my inspiration comes in, in, in a lot of ways from those guitars of the past, those designs. So that's the battle that I think I'm always going to be facing, trying to come up with something timeless and classic, and only time can, can make that happen. So in the moment, it's really hard to go, hey guys, this will be a classic. I don't know if it will, but I'm hoping at some point that they'll be viewed that way. If there's an ethos, it's kind of respecting things that have come before and wanting to sort of further them and add my own stamp to it. I pull elements of things that I like, you know, and um, kind of rearrange them and, and find myself in that or my designs in that. So for me, when I left Fano and started Novo, I've got a stack of drawings that didn't make the cut and I didn't know what I was gonna do, right? I had no idea what direction to go. I eventually wound up with this body style, which was uh, the first model that I made was the Sectus. The Ceres line came after the Sectus, but shared the same silhouette. So I was looking at things like the RB6 and the JM6 and thinking, well, how can I take elements of those and kind of combine them? Truly going beyond, here's a Jazzmaster shaped body that's got P90s and a Tunematic and stop tail, which was not, you know, a, a super like heady way to look at how do I blend these things. I was literally taking elements and kind of like, you know, kind of feeling my way around the idea of design. And I feel like that's evolved over time. So where I would take certain shapes, body lines and things and kind of see how I can kind of blend them together. And I think that's how I wound up with the, the Sectus shape, which is now the Ceres shape. So it was more like moving things around, kind of squishing them, stretching them, pulling them and, you know, kind of arriving at something that I could walk away from and come back a couple days later and not hate. My design process was pretty primitive back then. I use Illustrator to design now. I didn't have access to that. I, I, I wasn't, you know, up on, on Illustrator. I was literally drawing everything with, uh, you know, pencil and paper. It was a pretty messy, cumbersome process, but it worked, it, you know, eventually worked. But there, like I said, there is literally a stack of drawings of things that just, I didn't, I didn't know where to go. Just like with the design work, I threw around a lot of different ideas for, for the new name. First of all, I was looking for a Latin word. I thought about the origins of my name, my family, at least half of my family coming from Italy, that uh, the language that they spoke centuries ago would have been Latin. And I thought, okay, let's, let's find a Latin name, right? Sh shake things up a little bit. Because the other thing I didn't want to do is pick a name and then find out somebody was already using it or whatever. So I thought if I go a little off the map here. So when I found the word Novo, looked it up, what it meant, it meant to make anew. And I thought, okay, that kind of works. And then when I started looking at the word Novo, I found even deeper meaning. It begins with N-O, which is where Fano leaves off. And that's what I'm doing. I'm picking up where I left off. Uh, it ends in O, just like Fano does. It's four letters, just like Fano, right? So a lot of things here really seem to make sense. I like the meaning of the word. And, and that alone would have been enough. But then when I found those other sort of hidden meanings, at least to myself, I thought, you know, I, I think all signs are kind of pointing towards, not that I believe in anything like that, but I thought that seems right, you know, that, that feels right. So let's go with that. player and, and you know I'm I don't know if I'm in the minority there as far as guitar builders guitar designers I started out as a player but I also started out playing bass not guitar when I got my first real bass which was a 66 jazz bass it wasn't long after I got it and the thing had already been stripped down but it didn't take long for me to start pulling that thing apart and see what else I could do with it now I had zero 
prior knowledge or, or experience with guitars or basses and um, didn't know what I was doing. At one point got a, a Warmoth 8-string neck, bolted it onto that thing, got an 8-string bridge, uh, carved out very crudely a third jazz bass pickup up by the neck. I added another control plate that kind of like dovetailed into the existing control plate. The thing was gnarly. Doing that was kind of like the most fortuitous thing I could have done because the one thing I couldn't do in turning this four string bass into an eight string, I didn't know how to make a nut. And there was a, a local repairman that a guitar player that I was in a band with said, I bring my guitars to this guy, you should go check it, you know, check him out, see if he can make a nut for you. So I brought the, uh, the instrument over to uh, this guy, Daryl Gilbert, who worked at Gibson. He worked at the showroom in, in Midtown. I was in New Jersey at the time. And he said, uh, all right, let me make a nut for you. Came back a few weeks later when it was ready. He had made a brass eight-string nut for, for this thing. And uh, while, when I'm picking it up, I just asked him kind of casually, I went, how do you get into this? Like, what, you know, how do you start building guitars or repairing guitars? He goes, you know, probably an apprenticeship is a good place to start. He goes, what, you want to hang out here and like learn some things? And I started doing that. And that just kind of snowballed into, you know, everything that I'm doing now. I do most of my design work at home in my office. I try to do as much building while I'm here as I can. The signature guitars are the, are the guitars that I get my hands dirty with. I design those guitars. I will often mill the materials, you know, for the neck and the body, although they're executed, cut on the CNC. And we have great guys in fretting that do a better job than I can do, and I'd rather have them fret those guitars for me. What I like to do, I work weekends. I'm here when nobody else is here. It feels more like the way it was when it was just me, whether it was starting Fano or starting Novo. And, and it's just a great time to kind of get in here, crank up whatever tunes I'm in the mood for. But one of my favorite things to still do, like top line item is I love sanding. I know some people view that as like a dirty, messy job and it's like an entry level position for a lot of companies. I get it, but it's just for whatever reason, I enjoy it. Love sanding. I love taking something and sculpting it, shaping it, and, and you know, refining it. And that's, I think, it sort of ties into my, you know, kind of design process. But when I made the decision to move to Nashville, part of the reason for doing that was I knew that we'd have a good talent pool for us to kind of tap into. Knowing that, you know, Gibson was in town, they, of course, are going to just, you know, have a, a certain draw there, right? That that we wouldn't have on our own. What I do have is a great team that we've amassed over those six years, and uh, I've got other people that I can rely on to train new, new, you know, employees, new hires. Uh, you know, when we first moved here, I was still doing the distressing on all the guitars. I was doing the final play test on all the guitars. There just isn't time to do that. As I said, luckily I've got people who are, you know. Uh, completely competent to do that as well, if not better than I did. So, you know, it's a, it's a really good position. It's a favorable position to, you know, for me to be in, so. So raw materials come in on a pallet. Up until recently, we had been milling all of our pine here in-house. We recently formed a, a partnership with a, a company out in California that does rough milling for a lot of other guitar companies. So we're working with them and we're using the same material, the tempered pine, that we've been using for uh, you know the past six plus years. So when I was first starting up Novo, I reached out to my buddy Hans over at Tempered Tone Woods and I said, you know, I want to do something different with Novo. I kind of want to stretch the boundaries here. I want to get into some materials that nobody else is using. What, what can you, you know, send me? And he sent me a whole bunch of, you know, uh, sample blanks. One of those or a couple of those were pine and there was some tempered butternut. Uh, there was some tempered basswood and alder. Tried them all out built a handful of guitars. The pine to me was like really where it was at. And one of the most common materials for Fender guitars is alder. To me, pine sounds like what alder wants to be. It has a great kind of strong mid-range, 
Uh, it's actually pretty well balanced, but it's got this like forward kind of middle mid range to it. Uh, the reason for the pine is really just because it sounds pretty incredible and it's unique and uh, it's a sustainable material too. So that's important to me. our necks and bodies on the CNC's and there's a reason why every major successful guitar company that you go to they're using CNC's. CNC machine is a computer controlled milling machine, a router that will take the programs that we create here. I take my drawings and I hand them to John, our programmer. He then turns those into programs that can be translated by the cutters by the CNC to execute exactly the parts that we want consistently, precisely, you know, not only more efficiently, but safer than if we were having, you know, more hands on to do those sort of things. From there, necks and bodies go different places. Necks go to our fretting station. We do let our necks acclimate for a month before we do fretting. So we'll basically cut necks, we'll put them on the shelf. We'll let any sort of internal stresses kind of work their way out of that material so that when we go to clean up our playing surface and get frets into it, we've got as stable of a you know platform to work with. So when the body's done, it basically will go over to sanding prep on something like a, a J, it goes and it gets roundovers uh, with a radius bit on the router table. The neck goes through its various stages of inlay and fretting. The neck and body make their way into sanding eventually. They are then sanded by one of our three sanders that we have. Individuals will sand either one or the other, like a neck or a body. Then those parts come together to get fitted, uh, where we adjust the neck angle to make sure we're getting the right clearance at the bridge. Uh, we get the fit nice and snug in the pocket. Uh, we cut all of our necks slightly oversized, and we will slowly kind of take it down so that we get a nice snug fit. There's no loose necks in our pockets. We have a couple of key slots and, uh, and, a, and a quarter inch pin that just help keep that neck aligned and, and eliminates that lateral movement, kind of side to side movement. All of that is done, you know, kind of in fitting to make sure everything lines up as it should before it goes through another QC step and then moves into paint. From paint, the necks and bodies will go into distressing because that's something that we do on the majority of our guitars. Our extra lights are not distressed. There's no intentional distressing but the lacquer still gets leveled, uh, gets uh, a light buff, and then we polish them out. Necks will then uh, have their, their frets dressed before going into assembly. So the necks and bodies are brought in there along with all the other parts. We age our hardware. Everything is, is you know, kind of staged and ready to go together once it comes to assembly. There's some proprietary things we do along the way that you know I don't really want to get too deep into. Not like it's like super secret, but you know, even when it comes to something like texturizing our, our pine bodies, uh, that was something I kind of stumbled across uh, early on with the pine. I had one particular body that just had this really cool kind of gnarly ripple in it after the belly cut was carved into it, and I decided to leave it alone instead of kind of like trying to level it out and flatten it out, I thought, well, let's make this one unique. You know, well, it'll have a little bit of, I don't know if I referred to it as texture or ripple or whatever it was at the time, but it was a, it was a really cool touch. And I found through experimentation ways where I could actually kind of coax that texture out of every pine body. And um, again, it's kind of been a little bit of a signature thing that we've done. And I know that our supplier, my, my buddy Hans that I was talking about earlier, when he first saw it, he was like, holy shit, what are you doing? I didn't know pine could look like this. Like, you know, it was uh, it was interesting to see like somebody's reaction who's like around the material, knows that stuff. And because typically with a guitar finish, you want to level it out, you want to sand it so it's perfectly smooth. And that's just not what we do. You know, we kind of lean into a, a, a couple of things, the texture, super, super thin nitro finish and kind of just, um, you know, kind of celebrate the uniqueness of the of the material. <laughs> I 
started working at Matt Yunoff Guitars in Greenwich Village in 95, and I think it was around then that the custom shop, Fender Custom Shop, started putting out, you know, things like Blackguard tellies and stuff. And I started incorporating distressing uh, into my builds probably in 2006. So maybe, you know, a good 10 years later after they started. I you know by no means that I, uh, I didn't start this fire. <laughs> <laughs> and, and yeah, there is a firestorm, you know, depending on who you talk about or, or talk to about it. Some people just can't wrap their heads around it and, you know, always equate it to like a guitar being dragged behind a truck or jeans with holes and that sort of thing. It's like I was doing a lot of bespoke one-off custom guitars with, you know, as close to perfect finishes as, as I could achieve. And I had too many customers say like, oh, this thing's beautiful when they, when I, when they see the guitar for the first time. I don't want to put a scratch on it. I'm going to keep this thing in the case or I'm going to hang it on the wall and I'm never going to play it. And it's like, that's not what it's meant to do, you know? It's not a piece of art just to be admired or stowed away under the bed or in a closet. It's a guitar, it's meant to be played. So. I think after a couple of those responses from, from my customers, I thought, well, there's gotta be a better way. What if I just put the first scratch on the guitar for you? You know, the proverbial first scratch. Will you then find it more inviting and wanna pick it up and play it? And I found that that was the case. You know, like customers responded to that. I responded to that. When I finished one of those, you know, clean guitars, I would always have to baby it, you know, like a play test would be a very, you know, like, okay, I'm just, just going to play as, as little as I can, where I, I'm not running the risk of scratching this guitar for this customer. Uh, and when I started doing the distress finishes, it was like, man, pick up that guitar, play it for an hour, crank it up. Like, I just felt like, man, I could really dig into it. And that's what the guitar should be. It should be inviting. It should, you know, kind of draw you in and make you want to not just pick it up, but not want to put it down. That's the thing. And that's what the distressing does for me. I, I, I like the feel of a guitar that's kind of broken in. Main thing is not having lacquer on the neck when possible. I've made plenty of guitars with lacquer on the neck, but I, I prefer the feel of a, a nice raw maple neck. Our extra light distress is, it goes through the same process. It gets the thin nitro finish goes into our freezer to get weather checking, hit it with a heat gun. We, you know, as I said, kind of level that that lacquer and, and buff it out. What we don't do is we don't take our rocks to it, you know, which is really our, our main tool for distressing. I've got a couple of rocks over here on the bench. This is, this is my big rock and here's my small rock. And as crude as those are, they will achieve the right look for what we're going for here. Back in the Fano days, I used different implements. I didn't use rocks. I was using like hand tools, like screwdrivers and chains and stuff like that. Like it was a very different thing. So I don't know why rocks, but I just thought like, I don't know, it seemed to make sense to me at the time. What I want to do next is keep growing the business. I have a strong urge to keep growing this place. We are currently building about 20 guitars a week. And I think in order to, to meet the demand and also my desire to build something bigger and more substantial, you know, I'd like to see us continue to push that number. We're going to need more space. We're, we're kind of busting at the, at the seams here. I think there's only so much we can do on our own. We went direct back in 2020, although that was a really good move for us at the time. I think things are changing and there's a need for us to look at other resources that would be beneficial to us. I think Reverb is going to provide a, a very great service and uh, not only to us, but to, to the customers in the end. It's going to help us, you know, get a little bit more exposure. You know, we have a, a pretty loyal following, but if we were to look at it, the, the number of people who are even familiar with Novo that know that we exist is, is pretty small. When it comes to reach, uh, 
I don't think there's any topping reverb. I think you guys are, are, are great at what you do and partnering with you uh, in this way is, is, a, is a really good thing for us. Because I've spec'd out, I think so far, 30 guitars for reverb. We have some very interesting things coming your way. The main thing that I wanted to do was, you know, have the guitars that are unique. And uh, that's something that I'm, I'm kind of always looking for. It's not always possible when we're, you know, taking orders for, for instruments that we offer. You know, there's a set amount of uh, options that we offer, that sort of thing. I'm looking to kind of stretch beyond that a little bit and have some guitars available through Reverb that have some, some things that we haven't done before. Specifically things like uh, a Voltour with a Mastery. We've had a call for that many times over, over the years, and I've kind of dug my heels in and said, no, the Voltour is what it is. I think it's gonna make for some really interesting instruments. The, the instrument itself, that, that body style, is just kind of calling out for, you know, for something more uh, than just the, that chop tele bridge that we put on it uh, as a standard thing. There's a lot of real estate back there there's, it's the perfect spot for something like that, you know, that offset trim. And um, we have uh, some Idrises coming your way that are gonna have two humbuckers. The standard Idris as it stands right now, what we've referred to in-house as the S3, has three Strat pickups, but we've got some H2s with two humbuckers. Still has that great man-made tremolo. I've got a long list of other things that I wanna get to. But I think the idea of, of kind of keeping the guitars unique uh, is, is a really, you know, fun thing uh, for us to do and uh, a great way for us to, you know, start this partnership. sitting still and just going, well, hey, look, look, look what we're doing here. You know, I want to take what we've done and see how, how we can make things better or kind of progress things, yeah. move things forward. I, I suppose without knowing it, I just, I, I had a, a need to see something kind of come to life. Like I want to build something from nothing, right? Whether that's a guitar or an entire company. It wasn't an easy decision to leave Fano, but I, I kind of thought, all right, I'm going to land on my feet. I'll figure something out and I'll, I'll, figure out what that next thing is going to be and you know I want it to be substantial I want it to to, to really be a you know a contender you know mm -hmm. 